Okay, so let me give a little bit of perspective for everybody here. Um, so my, my background, uh, my background is I've spent nearly 30 years in the corporate world and I've been involved in recruitment and selection, I suppose, the other side of the table uh, for, for many, many years, doing thousands and thousands of, of interviews. And I'm going to share some of that experience uh, with you. Um, I spent 22 years working in Irish Life, who are the biggest financial services company in Ireland, uh, in a HR role. Um, and about over five years ago, I left Irish Life because I always had an ambition to set up my own company. And it's called Think HR. And I spend a lot of time uh, in the corporate world, multinational, uh, national uh, companies, family owned companies running the likes of recruitment and selection processes, leadership development programs. I spend probably about a third of my time in sport. So I run leadership development programs for the GPA and the women's GPA and, and so on. So that's just some of the experience. I'm always also part of the IMI faculty as well. And I give a plug to DCU. I also did my master's in DCU as well. Um, so in terms of, I suppose, my direct experience in HR, and my direct experience in recruitment. My last role in Irish Life was, I was the head of HR Specialist Services. Um, essentially, I was responsible for all recruitment in the company, uh, whether that's volume recruitment or senior recruitment, the likes of learning and development and leadership development. If you split HR in two, everything to do on, with the people side, I was responsible for. And at various stages, we would have had 5,000 staff. In context, we probably would have um, had probably around 25,000 to 30,000 CVs coming in. So a lot, a lot of CVs. Uh, so I was very interested in what Jennifer was saying there. And our, our standard was competency-based uh, interview plus assessment centers for senior roles as well. So in terms of, in terms of this presentation, I'm, I'm assuming that your CV has been sifted. So sifted is the technical term to say, you know what, you're attractive enough for us to be called for interviewed. Um, so we've, 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 we've looked at your CV, we said, you know what, that's actually, that, that's, that, that looks good. Uh, so let's call this person for interview. So I won't be talking about job hunting and I won't be talking about your CV. I'm actually talking about preparing yourself for interview. But I'm actually going to do it from two perspectives. One perspective is from your perspective, the interviewee. And the other perspective is from my perspective, the interviewer. And what I always find is, and having been your side of the table many times as well, we tend to think about it from our own perspective only. So I'm gonna ask you to walk the shoes of the interviewer as well, because it's gonna help you in terms of your interview. Um, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide there. So, so some critical activities for you um, that you really need to do in advance. So the next couple of slides are around what you need to do. So it's, it's quite obvious that what you need to do is you need to do, uh, you need to do your research. So you've been called for interview, you need to research the company, you need to research the division you're gonna be working in potentially, what they do, who their customers are, uh, their, their team plans, how many people in the area and so on. And where do you get that information? Jennifer alluded to, to it there as well. So the advertisement, the job spec, the role profile, the company website. The, for me, your network, if you know somebody who works in the company or know somebody who knows somebody who works in the company, that's a great in because you're really getting an insider view in terms of the company. Uh, if you can find out not just about the work, but the culture of the company as well, I think that would be really, really useful for you. Um, and then if you, if you want to talk to say, for instance, somebody that you trust, say somebody that, that, that mentors you or maybe a coach in, in terms of the position as well, that's all part of your research. And um, I think what's really critical in terms of the actual position itself is to, is to identify the tasks. What are they specifically asking you to do in the role? So what are the tasks? What are the skills? So what are the, 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 the skills? What are the behaviors? What is it they're gonna be asking you to, to do uh, and, and say in the role that would make you successful in the role? And what do you need to know? So tasks, skills, and knowledge. Really, really important to research the actual position. Um, and then what's critical then at the very bottom there is researching the process. So the days of actually an interview being based on CV only are long gone. Um, in some smaller companies, you do get it. Um, and it talk me through your CV in that. But in my experience, even over the last five, 10 years, I, I haven't really done any of those interviews. Um, sometimes they're used as a, a kind of a, a, sif a for the sifting process to say, will we bring this person into the process? but tends to be, it tends to be more than just CV only. So you could have a competency-based interview. 
uh, whereby you've sent your CV, we're calling you to interview, and now you have to complete an application form, uh, which is competency based. And what we do from our perspective is we call out the competencies that are critical to the role. And what you need to do is you need to provide us with examples of where you have, um, where you have, uh, where you have uh, done the particular competency and you've be behaved uh, in the past. So you're bringing your war stories in many ways uh, and you're putting them down on paper and you're going to be interviewed based on those. And then there's the assessment center as well. So an assessment center is a mix of different exercises. So it could be an interview, it could be a presentation, it could be a role play, it could be a group exercise. Um, but they're all, they all tend to be based on a competency framework, which I'm going to take you through uh, in a second. And I think the other thing is, do you know at the outset how many stages there are? So lots of multinationals have multiple st stages, and I mean multiple, it could be six, seven stages. Um, whereas some organizations, it's actually two stages, um, whereby you go through the competency-based interview, and then maybe you're brought to uh, the, the managing director for the, for the final interview as, 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 as such, just to confirm the appointment, or you're down to the last two or three. But knowing at the outset how many stages in the process would be very, very useful. Now, sometimes you might, they mightn't even know because they don't know the caliber of candidates in the process. So for instance, they might at the outset think there might be uh, two stages, but it might end up being three or four. But having some sort of knowledge in that in the, in, at the outset would be really, really useful. So I'm gonna move us on to the next slide. So let's assume you've been called to interview. So you're attractive. Uh, your CV is attractive enough for us. We think, you know what, ticks, ticks, ticks a fair amount of boxes. We're going to call it the interview. So what I'm doing here is I'm assuming that it's a competency-based interview and that you need to complete an application form. Now, what is a competency? It's a blend of knowledge, skills, and traits um, that combine to make up your performance as such. And some examples I've just put down, but there's multiple examples of these. The likes of drive for results, communication and influencing, leadership, problem solving and decision making. So they're examples of competencies and they tend to form the basis of most interviews today. But lots of organizations in the background to that have created what's called competency models. So on the one hand, we call out planning and organizing and we call out drive for results and we call out leadership and that. But behind that, We've also called out the behaviors that are absolutely critical to success in this role. So what are behaviors? These are the things that you might say or do that brings leadership to life or brings communication and influencing to life. So we, we call out the behaviors and we create a league table, essentially, whereby we can score you in terms of your interview and the stories you bring to interview. And we can score you from a, on, a, on a one to five. So five being shoot the lights out, one being the complete opposite. And I'm going to show you examples of that. So yet again, this is looking at it from the interview viewer's uh, perspective. So in terms of the interview itself, the interview itself, a competency-based interview is based on behaviors. It's actually asking you for examples, for stories, for evidence. It's about evidence. It's not about your opinion. So for instance, I hear all the time, so I might, I might ask a competency-based uh, interview questions such as, um, so communication and influencing is really, really important to this role. Can you talk to me, talk me through an example in your past uh, whereby you, you feel you, you have a really good example of communication and influencing? And the answer I might get is, you're right, Martin, I think communication and influencing is really, really important. And they go on and talk about the importance of communication and influencing. I'm not really interested in that. I know that already. What I want you to do is to tell me, uh, give me an example, of, of whether it's in, in, in a community work you do, it's previous work you do, your sporting life and so on. Give me an example of where you feel uh, you performed really strongly in terms of communication and emphasis. So if you look at uh, a competency-based application form, I'm assuming uh, you possibly, you probably all have seen one of these, but just in case you haven't, in a competency-based application form, what we do as the interviewer, we call out the key competencies. So you can see on the left-hand side of the screen there, we've called out communication and influencing, drive for results, leadership, problem solving. So they are the critical competencies. We're saying besides the tasks that we need you to do in this role, this is how we need you to perform. So we need you to have strong communication and influencing. We need to have you to have drive for results, leadership, and, and so on. And what we do in the form is we give you a definition. So here's our definition of communication and influencing. So some companies have different definitions. And then we say, give us one to two specific examples below of a situation where you demonstrated strong skills in this area. 
And that's generally what happens when people get that. They say, God, what am I going to write here? Um, but before you think about your story and what you might write and what you might communicate at interview, I'm now going to take you to a different perspective, which is actually the recruiter's perspective. So this is all part of your research. This is what you're doing beforehand. But I'm now going to take it to the HR person or the recruiter, what they're doing in the background. And that will help you then subsequently decide, well, what war story, uh, what evidence am I going to bring to this page? So um, as the interviewer, what, what do I need to do in advance? Well, the first thing is I call out the competencies. So these are the critical competencies. Now, you might say, well, that's pretty easy, Martin. But it's not actually because there could be 20 important competencies uh, for a particular role. There could be 10, 10 to 20. What I'm doing here is I'm calling out the critical ones. And I am going to assess you and your performance at interview based on these particular competencies here, not other competencies, these particular competencies here. So I've read your CV uh, because you wouldn't be here at this stage if I didn't. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a set of behavioral indicators. So what would success look like in terms of communication and influ influencing? What would you say and do that would make you successful in terms of communication and influencing, drive for results and, and so on, and that would subsequently make you a success in the role? It's all about behaviors. This is all about behaviors, what you say and you do. It's all about your past experience. It's all about your stories. It's all about your evidence. Because the way competency-based interviews work is your past experience, your past evidence will help me predict your future performance. That's what it's based on. So it's your past experience, your war stories, not your opinions. I'll go back to that. I'm not really interested in your opinions at this stage. I'm really interested in the behaviors that you displayed in the past because that helps me predict future performance. So here's an example of what companies do in terms of behaviors. So all I've done here is I've taken communication and influencing. And what I've done in advance of your interview is I've mapped out what I think an exceptional performance would look like versus a strong performance versus an underperformance. So if I was looking at somebody for communication and influencing, I would expect the person to be able to flex their style depending on the task, the situation, the person they're dealing with, that they can flex their style. When they need to be assertive, they will be assertive. When they need to listen, they will, be, they will listen. When they need to ask the right questions, they will ask the right questions. So this ability to flex their style is really exceptional performance. If you looked over in the red box, you might see two, one style, black and white, and so on. So Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm mapping out a league table in advance of your interview, and I'm saying this is exceptional performance, this is strong performance, and this is underperformance. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm listening to your stories, your examples you're bringing to interview, and then I'm, I'm scoring you. I'm saying, was, that, was communication interesting exceptional? Was it strong, or was it an underperformance? So, so it's a league table as such. I'm going to move on to the next slide, which shows you a different example. So here's an example of a company that, that maps about one to five. They literally go, okay, so uh, poor behavior, absolute poor behavior over in the, over in the far right. It, that's a one, uh, two, three, four, five. They've mapped it out from one to, one to five. So yet again, in this case here, um, what, what they are doing is they're calling out these behaviors in advance. You don't know this, but companies do this in the background. They have competency frameworks, they've built them, and they are mapping out the behaviors, exceptional performance, strong performance, underperformance, or they're mapping it out one to five. So, so this is really critical for you to know because what you need to think about then is, well, actually what stories, what evidence, what proof can I bring to interview that will hit these particular behaviors here? Because that's actually gonna get me to score high in terms of performance. But the reality of it is, it actually has to be the truth. It has to be a real, real story. It has to be proof. There's nothing worse uh, being the interviewer and you're hearing a story and you're saying, well, actually, that's a really good story, but it has nothing to do with communication and influencing. It's actually got something to do with another competency that not, we're, we're not even asking for here. So it's really, really important to bespoke your stories to the particular competencies. So going back to your, what you need to do, so I'm after giving you my perspective in terms of what I need. Uh, so from your, your perspective now, what you need to do is you need to provide real stories, um, real evidence, from your, 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 your past that demonstrate behaviors outlined in the behavioral indicators. Now, no company will give you the behavioral indicators in advance. Why would they do that? But this is what they do. Um, but what you need to really think about is if they're asking me for an example around customer service orientation, 
what do they mean by customer service and, uh, orientation? What would they be saying? What would they be doing? What would I be saying? What would I be doing that would bring cu customer service orientation to life? That I'd be doing it really, really well. And think about the behavioral indicators. So what you need to do is you need to think about, do I have evidence? Do I have proof? Do I have a really, really good story that will get me into that exceptional category or that strong uh, category? Because I don't want to be into the, in, in the underperformer category. So before you write your stories, or before you communicate your stories, always think, well, what is the competency? What are the behaviors? And then actually tailor your example, your stories uh, to the particular competency. So I've given you here an example of a template that I would always, if I was coaching somebody, I would ask them to always uh, think about in advance. So this is just a very simple one. You could actually do your own Word document here. But all I've done here is on the, on the, on the far left, I've outlined the five competencies. Um, the next thing is, what, what do I think the behaviors are? So if I, if I was thinking about communication and emphasizing, what do I think the key behaviors might be? What is it that I would say and do that would really show strong communication and emphasizing? And then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write my example. Um, so what you need to do with each competency is pick one example, or sometimes they ask for two examples, um, and it needs to be absolutely relevant to communication and emphasizing, and it needs to be relevant to the behaviors for communication and emphasizing. Now I'm always asked the question, well, what about, could I ask, could I, can I use the same example multiple times? No, you can't. You can if you want, but you probably won't, uh, you probably won't win the role. Um, so you need to try and use different examples throughout the application form. I think a golden rule would be if you're going to use it, use it, you can use it max in two places. Uh, but you need to make sure in both places they are bespoke to the particular competencies and the behaviors being asked. Always have a backup example. When you hear that golden question, can you give me an, another example of communication emphasizing? You know you haven't hit the mark. So always have a backup example. And always start by thinking about the behaviors. Not necessarily about the competency, think about the behaviors. So what is it, communication emphasizing or drive for results, what is it they're really asking for here? Um, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit in, 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 in subsequent slide on how you communicate your example. Uh, so you've heard about STAR, Jennifer alluded to STAR uh, there. So it is a great way of, of communicating and structuring your answer or structuring your story and so on. But I think one of the things you have to be aware of, it's actually overused. So in many ways, by all means, use it. But don't let me know you're using it. Uh, because I, as an interviewer, I can see through it a mile away. And you, 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 you find a lot of people now are being coached to use STAR. And they're nearly saying, here's the situation. Here's the task. Here's the actions. Here's the results. And it just doesn't come across as natural. I'm going to move us on to the next slide then. So how do you communicate your examples in interview? Um, well, one of the things that you, as I said to you earlier on, you're not going to get the behavioral indicators um, in, ad in advance. So in many ways, what you have to do is you have to do your research. You have to do, your, your, in many ways, your guesswork around, well, what, what are the key behaviors around communication and emphasis? But then the way to communicate your example during interview is using STAR. And I'm not going to go into STAR in any great detail. Jennifer covered it there. There's loads of really great material actually online around STAR. But a couple of things I'd say to you about, about, about STAR is if you're using the example, make sure that you can talk about the example from start to finish. It's really important. So I kind of get the, sometimes I get the situation, sometimes I get the T and the A, and then there's no results because actually it hasn't finished yet. This project hasn't finished yet. Or sometimes I get the particular example and I say, well, you know, that's a, that's a good example, but it's absolutely nothing got to do with communication and emphasizing. So you're not going to score well there. Uh, so you have to make sure that whatever example you bring to the table, that it's actually about communication and emphasizing. It's not about something else. That's really, really, really important. And uh, so in terms of STAR, by all means, use it as a structure. I always say to people, have it in your head have it in your head, but don't call out, here's the situation, here's the task, here's the actions. Just tell it as a natural story because it just comes across as really unnatural. Um, like for instance, I've often heard people, let me start that for you. So they, they tell you in advance, let me start. And it just comes across as really rehearsed um, and it just doesn't come across as natural. I'm gonna move us on. So in terms of the actual interview itself, some of the things you have to think about is, on the one hand, I'm gonna be asked competence questions. 
And on the other hand, I'm going to be asked character questions. Really interesting. So the competence, competence questions, there's loads of stuff online around this. Um, so you, 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 can you give me an example? Can you talk me through a situation? For instance, here, the example here on communication influencing. Can you give me an example where you face significant resistance and you successfully influence stakeholders to buy into your agenda? Talk us through how you dealt with the situation in terms of communication and influencing. That's a competency-based interview question. Then you're going to get subsequent question, questions. What was the role? Who were the stakeholders? And so on and so on. So you can start at very, very easy. You can do that naturally very, very easy, as long as you have a really good example. And I, I also have a couple of other examples of competency-based interview questions around communication influencing. But one of the things I find is catching out a lot of people now is they're not thinking of the character questions. So just everybody online, I think there's 117 of you online now. If I was to say to each of you, how would you describe your personal values? I bet you there's a few of you online now going, God, I never thought about that before. Or actually, I have thought about it, but I've never written it down. So that's one thing. And then if I was asked you the second question, how do they manifest themselves on a daily basis? Bet you a lot of you can't answer that question off the top of your head. So, so what, what is character? Character is who you are. It's what you stand for. It's about your values. It's about whether you live those values or not. Um, so, so knowing what your values actually are, your personal values are, and how they manifest themselves on a daily basis. And whether those values, by the way, will complement or jar the corporate values. So as part of your research, you will research the corporate values. But sometimes, actually, funny enough, the personal values will actually jar, or the, the corporate values will jar with your personal values. Because, for instance, they mightn't be really strong on, on corporate social responsibility, whereas that's a big thing for you in terms of your values and, and, and so on. I've also put a couple of... Couple of uh, questions there that yet again sometimes people just do not think about because they spend so much time on star and competency based um, so like for instance who is your role model and why um, tell me a time where you failed at something um, what do you think everybody a book that everybody should read um, tell me a time uh, tell me something about that that isn't in your cv for instance and, and, and so on so so they're all character questions that will be asked in interview um, during your lifetime, no doubt about it. And what I'm finding is that a lot of interviews now are veering from just purely competence to nearly 50-50 competence and character. So what I'd suggest to you in terms of your preparation is think about the competence piece and your examples, but also think about the character piece, who you are, because it's really, really important. What, what I always find, and I've always found down through the years, it's the character piece that gets us in trouble. It's not necessary the competence piece because the competence piece can be developed, but it's the character piece that gets us in trouble. So, and I think lots of organizations are now thinking that way as well. And as a result, they're actually asking you those questions. So really think about those in advance. I'm gonna move us on. So just a couple of other things to consider. Um, so practice in advance. So can you do a mock interview with someone you trust who will be honest with you? I think that's really, really important. Like for instance, some people don't have somebody they can practice, but practice in the mirror. Just practice, make sure that you are practice, that you're not thinking off the top of your head during, during the interview. Um, go prepared, for instance, your CV, the application form, make sure you have water and, and, and so on. Make sure you have all that. Uh, your body language, uh, your eye contact, make sure it's, it's, it's really positive on the day. What I also say to you is, is that, the minute you go into the, in, into the office, the reception and that, you are actually being interviewed. Because as the recruiter, I'd often go out to reception and ask, well, how did, how, how did uh, uh, Pierre Angel get on? At, uh, how, how was he at the start? And, 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 and so on. So I take that into account. So you're actually on the minute you get into the office or the room, wherever you are, make sure you realize that you're on. Um, there's loads of really good stuff, by the way, in terms of body language and eye contact, yet again, that you can get uh, on, on, online. Um, any questions? Should, should I ask and what should I ask? I would always say, yes, you should ask questions. Uh, you should probably keep them to a max of three. Um, what should I ask about? Um, I, it really depends from your own perspective. I, I think it's absolutely fine. Um, I like to ask character more questions than, than the council. So I, for instance, how would you describe the culture of the organization? Um, uh, what keeps you working in the organization? 
for instance. Uh, it's they're they're really and 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 actually they challenge me as 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 the interviewer. Obviously, you can talk about well, what are the next steps in terms of the recruitment process? How does performance get evaluated and so on? Whatever you think, I think I think it's important to ask questions and keep it to a max of three. If you're asked a really difficult question, for instance, um, that's fine. Uh, I would always say bring a piece of paper and a pen. And if it's a really difficult question, take a couple of moments to write the question down. And if you haven't got the answer to the question, what I would always say is, look, I really need to think about that particular question there. I've written it down and I'm going to come back to it at the end of the interview, if you don't mind. But it's there and I'll definitely come back to the question. So it's just buying you some time in terms of the interview process and, 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 and so on. Now, I said I'd try and do this in about 20 odd minutes. And I think that's about it. But can I just stress in terms of interviewing, it's really, really important to think about it from the employer's perspective. What is it that they're really asking? What is it that they're really looking for here from you? And that you bring your stories, your evidence, your proof uh, to the table, whether you do it on paper, you have to do it on paper, and you also have to do it in an interview as well. But it's all about behaviors. It's about what you say, it's about what you do. And it's also about that, that really key piece, which is around your character as well. So who you are, and some of you probably haven't taught long because I, I, I coach a lot of people. Sometimes we don't self-reflect enough in terms of who we are, what we stand for and, and, and so on. And companies I'm really, really interested in who is this person that's sitting in front of me here? What do they stand for? What do they not stand for? And, and so on.